Okay, we're looking at the first chapter, which is dealing with essential ideas. Uh, it's a very broad topic, or a very broad chapter, but um, does have a few good, interesting things in it. All right, starts out with um, putting chemistry into the realm of where it is in modern science. I mean, uh, we've gotten to the point where chemistry is a bit too broad of a subject. It's almost like saying you have a major in science because chemistry feeds into so many different things nowadays. Matter of fact, my uh, master's degree, which is computational chemistry, kind of fits um, almost down here, but also over here because it was polychlorinated benzenes, which was an environmental danger was what we were doing studies on. So it's very vast and very different. And we're seeing this all over the place, which is why if we were to bring up the um, list of your majors or the areas of focus that most of you are in, we do have most of these boxes covered. Um, there are students from all over, even in our small school here in Florida. All right. Um, our book touches on the scientific method, method, method in this chapter. There is not anything new here. This is the same type of stuff we've been telling you about science since fifth grade. Um, when we actually do this uh, type of thing for real, you observe it, you study it, you make up a rule, your law for it, mathematical equation, and you move on. Uh, nothing's really changed here. Um, now, we're going to introduce some new aspects and terminology in this chapter, but it fits into a few categories. Macroscopic and microscopic are the two biggest ways to split things up when we study our chemical properties and physical properties. Macroscopic is things that we can actually observe. The density is a good one. Solubility is something, whether it burns, flammability. Microscopic, we can't see off always. Like it does say salt being a crystal. You can see that salt's a crystal, but you might be not be able to see with the naked eye the exact structure. And is it always a crystal? And is it the same as a sugar crystal? So that crystal aspect and what makes it up is actually something microscopic. We'd have to get a lot closer. Okay. Um, the bottom one's dealing with symbolic. Now, what we're seeing here is ways we can represent a particular atom or molecule. Now, um, what we're talking about on all these, these examples down here, they're all glucose. Um, there's just different ways of drawing it. Um, glucose, the name, is probably the easiest way to draw it, obviously. You just flat out name it. But right next to it, the C6H12O6, that's the actual chemical formula. It is actually a, relay, a ratio. It's uh, for every carbon, there would be a water. It's a carbohydrate. Uh, glucose is a carbohydrate because it fits that category. But there are a lot of carbohydrates, and it turns out they all fit that category. Matter of fact, even C6H12O6 is not enough to guarantee it's glucose. Even fructose has the exact same chemical uh, molecular formula, same number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. It's just how it's put together differently. Now, this next structure is almost like a Lewis structure. It's missing some lone pairs on it, but it's almost like a Lewis structure of what actually glucose, how it's arranged. Now, the orientation of all these carbons is kind of interesting. So you see how this bottom carbon, hydrogen on the left, OH on the right, on the right everything else, uh, the carbon double bond and oxygen is on the top. Um, it has a right and, hand, right and left handedness to it. It's a stereo isomer. Matter of fact, if you were to reverse that one location, that carbohydrate can no longer be processed by any mammals on uh, Earth. It's no longer a carbohydrate. It's now just a chemical. Um, something about that structure is important. All right. The interesting thing is all those, inter all those rotations actually make this glucose, and yet it's even more interesting. Glucose doesn't ever look like that. Uh, that is a representation to try to show that location. It is closest to look like this particular one. Now, that's a three dimension. That's a two-dimensional picture of something that we think occupies three-dimensional space. In the sense that this is a six-membered ring, and that's why it's thicker here. It's trying to jut out at you, give you that depth idea. It's got a structure to it, three-dimensional. Um, that chemical structure of glucose shows that complexity there. 
but that's actually what it probably looks like in table sugar any given time, or at least about 33% of the time. Most of the time, this OH down here is actually up, coming up this way. It actually uh, um, comes off and replaces itself, moves to a different location. All right, but that symbolic thing, and I went through a lot of things there in glucose, is something kind of interesting. It helps us distinguish different properties of glucose. And that's what we're talking about. We're actually seeing that shape. We're seeing that differences. We're seeing how bonds move around in that symbolic nature of chemistry. And that's what we expand. That's what we expand on throughout this entire chapter or the entire book to get more into that expansion. All right. The initial domains, when we're looking at something in that macroscopic and microscopic ways, we try to relate them. So the picture here on the left is an iceberg out in the ocean, and there's clouds above. Well, technically, we're seeing, maybe not the gaseous state, but we're seeing the three phases of water in that picture in nature. The clouds are water vapor. Uh, the ice is solid water, and the ocean is liquid water. Uh, we're seeing all three phases in of water right there. Now, on the right, we have these blown up pictures. Now, what they're trying to show is how the water molecules are interacting with each other and different things. So that's what these are supposed to represent. The little white dots are hydrogens. The red dots are oxygen. When we have gases, they're really, really far apart. They're almost ignoring each other, not in contact. If they do hit each other, they bounce off and keep right on going the opposite direction. They pretty much have no interaction with each other other than the bounce. Now, on solid and liquid, there is attractions. On uh, um, liquid, there's a little bit of dynamics there. They can move around some, but they, they are pretty much going to bond to the water molecule they're closest to always. In ice, solid water, they've just got to the point where that bond has oriented itself in a very particular pattern. Now, you notice how these are little hexagons? Well, that's actually what ice crystals look like. It is little six-sided hexagons, obviously very, very tiny, um, but really interesting, it almost forms the exact same structure, geometrically speaking, as carbon does when it forms diamond. Gives ice a tremendous amount of strength, um, especially compared to water. All right, so our classifications of matter can be separated as solid, liquid, and gas. Matter is anything that occupies space. Um, if you took um, any classes up, what, elementary school? Those are definitions from elementary school and not really changing. Yeah, there are other things that we consider states of matter, but in chemistry, everything's a solid liquid or a gas. The next one is something kind of new to us, but it is something you might be aware of. Law, law of conservation of matter just basically means that when a chemical change happens or physical change, um, there is no measurable change in mass. Now, that actually can throw people for a loop because if you think about, um, I'm going to just draw it with a, and we'll just say gas, gas can. If I put a rag down in there and set it on fire and burn the gas, not blow it up, just let it burn off, we would imagine that that gas tank would lose weight because at first it's full of a liquid gas, gasoline, and when it's all done, that gasoline would be gone and that can would weigh less. Well, that is true. The liquid does go away. But if I were to somehow build the, put that entire container inside a sealed box and then set it on fire, I would find that when we're all done, the box would weigh the exact same thing from beginning to end. Because technically, when that gasoline burned, it created CO2 and water. Now, you don't notice those masses when they come out of like your car tank because they just go into the atmosphere and the atmosphere handles it on its own. But there is a mass change. Every time we burn it, it is actually gaining that mass. Just Mother Nature has a way to get it back out of there. It's not like we're going to overall increase the weight of the atmosphere just by running our cars. But in a sealed container, we could see that there is no change in mass. It is uh, um, just changing how it's put together. All right. On to another term that we had an in intro that we're just revisiting here, atoms and molecules. Atoms are 
our smallest thing um, that holds chemical properties. Uh, we now know quarks and whatnot that are smaller even still, but to have a chemical property, we uh, don't see anything smaller than atoms that have that aspect of it. Um, now, we don't typically find atoms by themselves. We don't find them pure in nature. Some metals get mostly pure, copper, gold, uh, aluminum. Uh, you can typically find them mostly pure. Almost, uh, it, it, I have to say mostly pure because it turns out many of those will actually form very thin layers of corrosion on the outside. Aluminum actually has a very thin layer of aluminum oxide most of the time. But it doesn't rust away because it actually protects the inner part of the aluminum from decomposing. Now, our noble gases we do find pure, uh, at least more often. Helium, neon, argon, um, you can get those relatively purified because they're easy enough to pure. All right, next one is our molecules. Molecules and compounds are simply uh, made up of more than one atom. Now, sometimes they're just the same atom multiple times. That's what they're showing here on this top one. Sometimes there's atoms from different uh, uh, molecules made from atoms of different types, water, CO2, and then there's the glucose again. Uh, but there's a lot of those molecules. Matter of fact, we're not limited on those ratios because uh, what I mean by that, there is H2O, which is water, but there's also H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. And you definitely wouldn't want to uh, um, uh, mix those two up. All right. When we put them together, we drastically change their differences. So what I'm talking about here, not so much the classifying matter as much as how we actually make them. Because salt, table salt, is made out of sodium and chloride. Yet sodium is a metal and chlorine is a gas when they're all nice and purified. Um, and if we were to look at the melting points and the boiling points, the melting point and boiling point of sodium chloride don't seem to be related. I mean, because this metal, 97.8 and gas, negative 101, difference of 200 degrees, middle of it will be right around zero degrees Celsius. Yet this is definitely not an average of those two. It's mainly because the chemical properties change drastically when you start to combine them in different ratios. Matter of fact, the sodium and chlorine by themselves are almost a bit dangerous. Um, sodium, um, even though it is a metal, it's not one that we'd want to do typical metal things with. Well, first, uh, think about trying to boil water in something that melts at 97 degrees. The pan would melt long before water boils. But it actually turns out you wouldn't even get to that point because sodium reacts violently with water. It actually causes the uh, water to break down into hydrogen gas um, and at the same time makes it makes um, hydroxide. So it turns the water real basic. Um, it can be fast enough that it catches fire. Like uh, the picture there, that's a big enough chunk that if we were to take that and throw it into a body of water, it would actually make a little bit of noise. It wouldn't be like an explosion per se, but um, it would be kind of violent. Uh, next one is chlorine. Um, being that we're here in Florida and sunshine state, most of us have been around a pool enough to know that you can tell a difference between a pool that has too much chlorine and too little. Yet, I don't think anybody's ever seen a situation where the pool has a little bit of a yellow hint to it because of the chlorine is so concentrated. That's a lot of chlorine in that container. That could do some damage if you were to have that and then you opened it up because it turns out the chlorine would react with the water in your eyes to make concentrated acid right there in the in your pupils fun huh huh all right mixtures are a type of matter we're going to come in contact that is not pure matter of fact most of the time we come in contact with uh, substances it is going to be a mixture now you can typically tell the difference between homogeneous and heterogeneous just by looking at them because homogeneous is going to look uniform throughout. Heterogeneous is not necessarily going to. The examples they have here of the heterogeneous, they're showing with something like oil and vinegar salad dressing. And while it is true, if you shook that up a lot or threw in a blender and blended it and kept it blending, it would probably look like a uh, single uh, um 
or it probably looked uniform throughout. But as soon as you stop mixing that, it is going to settle. So heterogeneous is typically something you can see, because if it's going to settle out, that's just a heterogeneous mixture. Homogeneous mixture is something like that Gatorade or Kool-Aid or any mixture we make that actually is actually distributed throughout. And really, think about this. If we were to make that um, Gatorade from that powder where you add water to it, you can't really undo that too easily. It's not like you can remake the powder, because once it's dissolved, it's kind of dissolved. All right, so when we classify matter, we have those pure substances, like our pure elements we're talking about, and we have the mixtures. That really is the big split up between those two. When we look at the mixtures, we typically can see heterogeneous and homogeneous. On the pure substances, it's not always obvious if you're dealing with an element or compound. There are fewer elements. It's going to be a lot easier to tell copper than most things because copper looks like pennies, uh, and there's not many other things that look like that. But if it's just a liquid, um, it'd be very difficult to tell the difference, to, to, to distinguish between water and even ethanol or gasoline, unless you were able to do some other things like maybe smell it or taste it. All right. Next little thing we're talking about is our chemical and physical properties. Now, these are actually distinguished very easily by just asking yourself, can you undo it? What I mean by that? A chemical change does actually fundamentally change what we're dealing with. Burning of gas does indeed make carbon dioxide and water. And heat, obviously. That is definitely a chemical change because it created new things. But a physical change would be something like maybe take some dry ice. I'm doing this because it's CO2 again. Turns out dry ice is just solid CO2. Um, when dry ice goes through its process to, to, to warm up, it, that solid CO2, that is an S, goes right to turn into a gas. It comes off as a gas. Um, but it's a very cold gas because the dry ice is, itself is cold. We can use it to cool things really well. Um, but it is just a physical change because we can actually undo it just by changing the temperature. Well, in that case, you don't really change the temperature. You just uh, pressurize the CO2. But a physical change can be reversed typically by changing temperature or pressure. Temperature much more often. Because think about ice. How do we make it? You get water really cold. But we just can simply look at most situations, ask if you can easily undo it or if you can undo it, the physical changes are one you can undo. Now, um, watch out for that, though, because a physical change that you can't undo, at least not naturally, would be maybe like cutting a piece of paper or chopping up a tree. Um, when you're done, you would have two pieces of paper or two pieces of a tree, and you can't rejoin them. But at no time did you cause a chemical reaction. You just changed the nature of what that physical property was. All right. Next little thing we're talking about um, in this new one for us. We didn't have anything like this in intro. Extensive versus intensive properties. Now, extensive properties are ones that will vary by changing the amounts. Mass and volume are chosen because um, they're kind of obvious. If you um, have a... Uh, uh, one penny, it's going to have a certain mass. If you have two, it's going to have probably close to double that mass. The mass would increase because you have more pennies. Same with the volume. If you increase the, the um, amount, you would increase the volume. So by extensive properties are ones that do change when you change the amount. Now intensive are ones that are independent of that. So go back to that penny analogy. If I added pennies to a collection of pennies, I would not expect the temperature to change, especially if all those were held at room temperature. Just just increasing the amount of pennies that wouldn't have any direct relationship with the temperature. But another one, intensive property, is going to combine these two up here. If you were to take the ratio of the mass to the volume for those pennies, you would get the density. The density of pennies is pretty much close to the density of its components. So copper and zinc. And it would be kind of fixed in the sense that 
if you always if you looked at that ratio it wouldn't matter if you have one penny or a thousand you'd expect that ratio be the same and that's uh, uh, that's showing us that density is an intensive property it's independent of the amount of matter you will find typically density is related to the type of matter or the identity of it um, if it was a pure sample of copper rather than a you know, pennies are zinc and copper but if it was a pure piece of copper you would find it has the exact same density of any piece of copper. All right, next thing we're looking at in this chapter is the actual periodic table. This is a, a, a picture of the periodic table that you will get access to on your tests. Um, we have it set up um, blue representing metals, yellow representing nonmetals. Those green ones are what we call uh, metalloids. They actually have properties of both metals and nonmetals, and they can be manipulated which is why silicon gets used as computer chips, because you can start with a single piece of silicon and make it not conduct electricity by making it behave more like a non-metal or make it conduct electricity, so more like a metal, just by what you put it with. So when they actually make computer chips, they kind of are drawing where they want it to conduct electricity. All right, the white ones down at the bottom are ones we're not sure. They're probably metals, but those are the ones that are made by man uh, are humans, and there's not many of them. Matter of fact, uh, the last four, Oganesium, 118, Tennessee, 117, uh, Moscovium, 115, and Nihonium, 113, uh, which would just got on the periodic table a couple years ago. Um, I think there's a grand total of 10 of those atoms known to exist of all, all together. So that's not like they, they, um, they don't occur in nature. They are man-made. Matter of fact, everything hollowed out. So from uh, 93 on up, they do, you do not find those in nature. They are actually made in a nuclear chemical process. All right, on to measurements. Now, in chemistry, in all science, you will see that a number is never enough. It'd be almost as simple as going to a swimming pool. I'm going to draw a swimming pool here. And right on the side of it, you just see the number three. Well, what the heck does that mean? Does that mean uh, uh, no more than three people in the pool at a time? Um, have to wear three shoes? Uh, a number by itself is useless. On a pool, you would expect that to have a depth next to it. Here in America, it'd probably say three feet. And that's on there, so you know that if you jump in and you don't know how to swim, more than likely you'll be able to stand at the bottom and be perfectly fine. And also, if you can swim, you know not to dive in there. But there is technically a little bit of uncertainty into it, because even on that pool analogy, is that exactly three foot deep? Well, of course not. It's where we, where we likely have uh, the, the approximate depth the water is, because water evaporates. You have to fill it up. Water is going to be above or below that three feet mark a little bit. Now, if you were in the Olympics and you want to have precision, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, they probably have on the side of the pool, on the inside, maybe a little uh, a marker. And at the top of that marker is right at three feet exactly. And if it's exact, they might even go back and say, well, it's not just three feet. It's 3.0 feet. Now, they wouldn't be saying necessarily that the water is that deep. They'd be saying to that line is that deep. So if the water's to that line, it's right at three feet deep. But what we're seeing is how we've written the number, we've added a little bit more precision to it. We're saying that on this thing, we're estimating that it's right around three feet. Here we're saying, well, this line is right at 3.00 feet or 3.0 feet, where we got a lot more certainty to it. So we're going to look at that a little bit more and actually see how it applies to other situations like we might see in chemistry throughout. <coughs> but right now, we're going to talk about units. Now, our standard units for the uh, um, all scientists is the SI units. Uh, it is approved by every single scientific journal, whatever, that we can come across. About the only place this isn't standard is an American and... Uh, normal American behavior because uh, 
standard measurement of length in America is maybe the foot or yard, but it's definitely not the meter. And a typical mass or weight in America is the pound. All right, where do these come from? Well, the rest of the world, as in every other nation other than America, uses the metric as their primary means of measurement. <coughs> and you, a uh, scientist, will be actually using those standard units as well. Because turns out, even though we like um, feet and miles and whatnot, um, you can't use those in science anymore. In medical field, you can't use them either. Matter of fact, a body temperature of 98.6 is not acceptable in a medical chart because they assume Celsius always. And 98.6 is nearly the boiling point of water. And if a human being was in boiling water, um, you wouldn't be filling out a medical report. All right, but these are the standard units. And it's just these. So length, mass, time, temperature, current, amount, and luminosity are the only standard units. Um, and uh, we will get a chance to look at all of these throughout Chem 1 and Chem 2, with the exception of Candela. This is about the only time we will see it. So how intense is a light? Uh, we won't see that one, but we'll actually touch on all the rest. All right, prefixes, just a continuation of something we introduced to you in intro. There are a lot of these uh, dealing with very, very small and very, very large. Um, we just need to get a little bit more comfortable using them all and understanding the exchanges so you can move from one to the other um, because we see these a lot. They, they are um, all over the place. And sometime in your lifetime, a petabyte will be the hard drive that everybody has on their phone, I would imagine, especially how fast they grow. All right. Um, derived units are pretty much everything else. So if it wasn't one of the SI units, it's a derived unit. And volume is a key one that was missing. Volume was not on that list as well uh, at all. And yet volume in the English system of gallons is something we see all the time. You ever went to the gas station? Um, so volume is something that's kind of important. Well, the closest thing we have to an SI base unit is based on the meter. So if we had a box that's one meter by one meter by one meter, awfully big box, uh, we would say that's one cubic meter, and that's the volume. Well, it turns out one cubic meter is also a thousand liters. Now, that thousand was just come up because it's a nice divisible number to reduce the size of that box. So one liter box is a heck of a lot easier to deal with. It's a lot smaller. Um, other derived units are those ratios we were talking about earlier of mass over volume. Turns out that's the density. Um, we change what the volume measurement is based on what you're dealing with. Solids, we measure that volume in cubic centimeters. Liquids, we measure in uh, milliliters. And because gases are so lo low on density, we use grams per liter because it moves the decimal three places, makes those numbers bigger. All right. Measurements are kind of interesting because they show us something about what we use to measure it with. What I mean by that, I have a picture here of a graduated cylinder. And if you look here, um, we're zooming in on this little box to see how much liquid's in there. And here's where it's really blown up. Now, we need all these because if you look between these two, like the 10 to 15, you see that each one of these hash marks must be on the milliliter. So, this being the 20 milliliter line, that must be 21 milliliters, and this must be 22. Well, I can't really report that the volume of that uh, liquid is 21 or 22 because we know it's not either one of those. It's somewhere between. All right. To show that we know it's somewhere in between, we're going to guess about where it is. We're going to read from the bottom of that meniscus. Um, that's slightly more than half, so I'm going to say this is 21 0.6 milliliters. Now, what we just did, we made up that number. That is an estimated digit based on a good guess. Now, uh, you get three people in there, we might get three slightly different answers, 21.5, 21.8, 21.7, but we will all get the same thing. That last digit is an estimated digit. 
there is going to be some gray area to it because it's how well you looked at it, how good your eyesight is, um, how easy it is to distinguish between the two margins or the uh, hash marks. So that estimated digit always has a little bit of uncertainty to it. But we would want to say it this way because if I were to leave it here and say it's 21, by writing just 21, we are saying that we're uncertain about the 1. And we're not uncertain about it. It is definitely above 21 and below 22. So we're going to show that by estimating a digit that doesn't have a hash mark. And that shows how good our instrument is. Now, different type of graduated cylinders do exist. There are actually some that are narrower and taller, and we get more and more hash marks. So you can be more precise. So the interesting thing about our measureds and those uncertainty, you can typically tell how those numbers were obtained just based on those digits. All right, now, skipped over this top weird thing, said exact numbers. That's a weird one. All an exact number is is something that has an unlimited uh, uh, significance or an infinite significance. It's like this one, 21.6, we're saying this is an estimated digit. What we're talking about on exact numbers is numbers that have no estimated digits. Now, easy one is definitions. One foot equals 12 inches. It's not 12.0 or 12.000. It's 12. It's defined that way. It's exactly 12 on the nose. There is no estimated digits whatsoever. Another exact number, think about a pizza. And you go buy it from someplace and they spend all their time getting those cuts being perfect, going right through the middle. Well, the number, the slices might be different sizes because they never get those perfectly the same. But the number of slices is kind of fixed. That one has eight slices. That eight has a certainty to it. There is no insignificance. It's not 8.0 slices. It's eight. It's exactly, it's a whole number of slices. All right, when we use these, we actually create what we saw significant figures by showing where we've estimated things and actually creating that idea of estimating digits. We've created some certainty in our numbers. And how we record it is kind of important, which is why 10 feet is not the same as 10 feet. All right, I know what I just said doesn't make sense because. I was the words was I said a was equal to a all right but that's because that's how you'd read both these numbers up here but how they're written is different see how this doesn't have a decimal point at all we're actually when you write it like that we're saying where our uncertainty is on that first number that 10 feet that's like how far it is between here and there it's an approximate number you didn't measure it it's just uh, we're approximately 10 feet away on the other one, by adding that decimal and this extra zero, we're just all of a sudden say all of a sudden saying we're uncertain about that last zero. So we got out with a tape measure and we actually measured it and we used our little hash marks and we know that that length between A and B is right around 10 feet. So there's a lot more significance in the second way. All right, but erasing this, we're going to talk about how many digits are significant? Just to flat out a number of them. What I mean by that, since we're saying this number is an estimated digit, we're saying it is significant. But everything to the left of it is significant, so this one has actually three significant figures. I just write sig figs here. But without the decimal there, we're actually saying that's our estimated digit, so this value, as it's written, means there's one significant figure. All right, so... How do we know what's a significant figure? That's what these rules down here say. So if it's not a zero, so one through nine, 1.23, 123.1, all four of those digits are significant, so it has four significant figures. Now, the zeros are gonna be treated slightly differently. If the zeros are sandwiched, so if they're in the middle of a number, it's got a, a, a non-zero at the beginning, a non-zero at the end. Everything between those non-zeros must be significant. So that number also has four significant figures. 
Now, the next one's weird and always creates a little bit of a problem. Leading zeros are not significant. So we don't count these zeros over here as being significant. The significant figures are just that 123. Now, the reason that throws that off is they seem to be important because you can't really remove those zeros without changing the number. But you kind of can. I'm going to move those three places and say that 0 0.00123 0, is actually the exact same as 1.23 times 10 to the negative third. Remember your scientific notation? We can do that. These are the exact same numbers. And now, as it's written over here, does it make any sense at all to have zeros in the front? Well, of course not. They're not necessary. So, any zero to the left is never significant. So this one had those three digits right there. That's the only significant figures. All right, that last one creates an interesting dilemma because um, on this last one, we're saying that trailing zeros are significant if a decimal pre is present. So what I mean by that, 1,200 without a decimal, we're saying that's the estimated digit, so this only has two significant figures. As soon as we add a decimal, the last digit is significant, that last zero. So all five are significant. All right, so our dilemma, how will we write that value with three significant figures? Well, turns out the trick's kind of weird. We're going to write this in scientific notation. 1.30 times 10 to the third. 1.30 times 10 to the third is, or I don't know why I said 1.3, 1.20. 1 1.20 has three significant figures. The 10 to the third gets it to be the right place. Okay, when we do calculations, we're going to do, uh, we're going to have to keep in mind our significant figures and apply that to our answers. What I mean by that, we're going to look at a couple problems. We're going to practice these. But I have this interesting problem down here, 55 times 120 times 1250. We want to do that math and then figure out how many significant figures there actually are. So I need a calculator. Clear this out. So I got 55 times 120 times 1250. We just do math like we normally do math. This gets to be 8,250,000. All right, that's a nice number. Math gives us that number, but our estimated digits are odd. What I mean by that, um, we aren't guaranteed to be as accurate as the significant figures our calculator gives us. What we need to do to figure out what this answer really is, is go back to our original problem and look at it and figure out which one of these three numbers has the fewest significant figures. All right, so three on that one, two on this one, three on this one. So two is the smallest number of significant figures. Since that 120 only has two significant figures, our answer is only accurate to two significant figures. So we need to round right there. So fifth grade definition, that's a two, that's a five, we round up. All right, addition and subtraction is slightly different. We still do the same first step. We just flat out do the math like it's normal. So 55 plus 120 plus 1250 gives us 1425. All right, and the math works. That is an acceptable value. But now what we need to do is round based on decimal places. Now that's what we said in intro. Turns out you don't necessarily have to have a decimal place to actually round. And I did that on purpose on these. While this one does have a tenth, this one doesn't. Matter of fact, it's estimated to a number. It's estimated digit is in the is in the tens place. Same as that one. All right, since both of those, that last estimated digit is in the tenths place, the answer needs to be rounded there. 
So the answer is not 1425, it's 1430. All right. Before we move on to this, we have to introduce something weird. Um, rounding is not completely taught right in most cases. Uh, these two, um, this rule about five is weird. We always actually set. So if you have 17.5, you look at that, that's five. You round up, it, that would go to 18. And if it's 17.49, that's smaller than five. So you round down to 17. But we round based on is it larger or smaller than 5. Oh, we should still do that. What we missed when we teach this is the fact that it needs to be larger than 5 and smaller than 5. Turns out, in real, realistically, if it's on the nose 5... It is definitely halfway between 17 and 18. We shouldn't always just round that up because that's not the case. It's halfway between. Half the time it should go up, half the time it should go down. So ages ago, they created this weird thing. That's this line right here. So if that drop, drop digit is 5 and it's 5 on the nose, um, you round up if this is an odd number, you round off if it's even. So I'm going to do that down here. 17.5, following this rule, should turn into 18. And yet 16.5 should go to 16. Odd numbers go even. Even numbers stay even. Weird rule, huh? All right. But it only applies when it's 5 on the nose. If my calculator actually given me something like 17.5000001, that is now definitely larger than 5, that always rounds up. So the only way this really applies is if there's 5 at the end and nothing else. All right, turns out both the problems we did, we rounded 5s. So we rounded that 5 off, and we rounded that 5 off. And it was five on the nose. So it turns out this answer should have been 8,200,000. Because it's five on the nose. That was an even number. It stays even. Now, next one, we had a five as well that we were losing. And it was five on the nose, nothing after it. So we look at the previous number and we see that it's even. So it stays even. All right, and that's the special rounding rule on five. Um, in the real world, you probably won't see it pop up. All right, so let's practice. We're going to round each one of these to just three significant figures. So start at my end, and I get my first three. So I'm going to round off the seven five. This one's going to turn into 0 0.0287. That's smaller than that, so this becomes just 18.3. 6.87, it's 5.2. It's not 5 on the nose, it's 5.2. That's definitely larger than 5. 6.88. And then last, 92.8. We're going to round at the 8. Previous number is a 5 on the nose. This is even. It stays even. All right, what's next? Next term we're looking at is accuracy versus precision. Now, what's interesting, these words get interchanged a lot, almost as if they mean the exact same thing, yet they don't. Now, to put them into perspective what we're dealing with here, I actually did this, That we got this picture, kind of looks like a dartboard, and we're talking about how this relates to accuracy and precision. All right, turns out that first one is accurate and precise. That's assuming this person was trying to hit the bullseye, the dead center. They got all of those darts right there in the center. They're all clustered together. That is accurate and precise. Now, the next one's not nearly as accurate because if you were aiming for the dead center and got over here, you missed some where you didn't correct yourself right. But look at that precision. The grouping is just fabulous. 
This person just re-aims ever so slightly and keeps that grouping. This one's going to look just like that. Now we get over here. This is how I play darts. I typically just throw them in the general direction. And if they get stuck in that dart board, I consider that a win. Um, so that's what we got here. These are all over the place, but they're all in the dart board. Um, so not really accurate and not very precise. All right. How would that apply to um, an actual scientific experiment? Well, we've got to keep our, our idea. Accuracy is how close to the accepted answer. Precision is how close they are to one another. Let's look at some actual experiment and see if we can see accuracy and precision. All right, so I got a 10 ounce container and I got four uh, containers tested by four different people. All right, so look out the, the ranges of the results because that's a good indication of your precision. The farther apart they are, um, excuse me, the less precise they are. All right, but if we look, this one here, our smallest is 283.9. Oh, wait, no, it's 283.3. So let's get rid of that one. And our largest is 284.1. All right, biggest reason I pointed that out, if you think about that, the difference is 0.8. So the range is not very wide at all. These, are, these guys actually have good indication. That there, there's quite a bit of precision there. All right. Go to dispenser three, we see it's slightly even better. Smallest there is 295.9. The biggest is 296.1. Difference of 0.2. Even more precision. All right, but let's let's ignore three, two and four for a second. I want you to notice this. One and three have really good precision. Uh, three is better than four, than the one is, but not by a lot. These have great precision. But look at the values, 296 here, 283 here. Drastically different masses. And if I look at this one, and even the average of this one, I probably am looking at a situation where this is low for some reason. All right, but the precision helps because being that that's got that narrow, that small, that small deviation or that range, um, this sample was probably... Um, done by a group that made one mistake and they made it every single time, which is why they had that precision. Those are typically problems that are easy to fix and easy to find because the, that precision helps. All right, but we don't know that for certain. We need to actually know which one's more accurate to know that these are off our error. And I didn't tell you how much this 10 ounce dispenser weighs. I don't didn't give you an accuracy, but it does turn out the... Uh, accepted uh, mass of that 10 ounce, 10 ounce container is around 296 grams. So three had it almost on the nose. Now we do see something interesting. See how number four has no precision whatsoever. Highest here is 316, lowest is 276. Difference of 50 grams, huge difference. But look what happens if I were to get the average of those three things. So. 306 plus 286 plus 316 plus 276 plus 296 and then divide that by 5 you will get 296 we get the exact same thing so if this group that did number four actually just calculated the, the average and got that 296, they might be able to try to argue that they have pretty good accuracy because they averaged out. But that's a little bit um, wrong because if we look at that, um, we have one, per, one of those measurements, got that 296 on the nose, but look how far off all the others. When the precision is this bad, it's almost like dartboards. When you're not grouping them up at all, anytime you hit the bullseye, that's just luck. That's not skill. That's just luck. Um, so this person that got the one measurement of 296, that's just luck. This, there was something going on with this group. They got some really bad results. All right. 
Last little thing we're doing in this chapter is introducing dimensional analysis. So dimensional analysis is just how we do our calculations in uh, chemistry. And I know you got some of this in intro, so we're just going to be reintroducing some of this stuff. So how many inches are there in 125 centimeters? Our goal is to convert inches to centimeters. We're going to use that conversion factor. So we're going to start with the 125 centimeters. And we know that one inch is 2.54 centimeters. And the centimeters would cancel, we get units of inches. And then on our calculator, we just take that, whoops, 125, and we divide it by 2.54. Since our 125 has three significant figures, we're going to report this in three significant figures. So that should give us 49.2 inches. Simple little dimensional analysis. All right, let's actually do a little bit more complex. So mass of a competition frisbee is 125 grams. And I want to know how many ounces that is. All right, um, I did give you the conversion of pounds to kilograms. I didn't give you anything else. I didn't give you grams to ounces. So we have to figure that out. We're going to go from grams, probably to kilograms, and then to pounds. And then we just need to know how many ounces are in a pound. Very America thing. It's not a nice whole multiple of 10. All right, 125 grams. Convert that to kilograms. One kilogram is 1,000 grams. We're doing that so the units cancel out. Um, one kilogram is 2.20462 pounds. And then it does actually work out that one pound is actually 16 ounces. So a lot more arrows, but still kind of doable. So 125 divided by 1,000 times 2.20462 and then times 16. And we get that a competition frisbee to three significant figures oh, should be 4.41 ounces. I'd love to know what the tolerance is on a competition frisbee. All right, let's do another one of these. How about this? Got some antifreeze. We know that four quarts of antifreeze happens to weigh 9.26 pounds. What's the density of the antifreeze? And I want the density in grams per milliliter. All right, so we got a couple things we're going to do here. So we are going to do a mass over volume conversion. So I'm going to do a mass of volume using the masses and the volume I give you. 9.26 pounds and 4 quarts. Oh, I don't need that. All right, now, technically what we're going to do is just a unit conversion for both these, but we're not going to try to turn pound quarts into gram milliliters. We're going to turn pounds into grams and quarts into milliliters. What do you mean? What do I mean by that? Well, I know I want to strategize this to get pounds into grams, so I'm going to use this unit I have. I have the 2.20462 pounds to give me kilograms. And I know my prefixes. So one kilogram is a gram. There's a thousand grams. Our units would cancel out. That would give us grams to quarts. And I want grams to milliliters. So I'm going to take those quarts and get rid of them. Quarts I can turn into liters. And I want milliliters, so one liter is a thousand milliliters. Liters would cancel, quarts would cancel. The units left there would be grams per milliliter. Now we're ready to do some math. So 9.26 divided by 4, and then divide that by 2.20. 462 
gives me this. I'm not going to do the 1,000 because technically I got 1,000 over 1 and 1 over 1,000. Those would cancel out. I just need to divide this answer by the point nine four six three five three to give a density of 1.11 grams per milliliter. All right, we're not going to do those. We're going to go right on to temperature. Um, we will have some more practice things with our worksheets and even the practice tests. So uh, look for those. All right, but conversions of temperature. Um, we are actually going to see how we can create a conversion factor go from Celsius to Kelvin and Celsius to Fahrenheit. Now, it turns out the Celsius to Kelvin is a piece of cake. If you look at the difference between the freezing point and boiling point of each of these, you can see to go from Celsius to Kelvin, we just need to add 200, and, well, wait, over here, add 270. No, I was doing that right to begin with. Look at my subscripts. Temperature in Celsius plus 273.15 gives you the temperature in Kelvin. Now, the Celsius to Fahrenheit um, there is a formula. When we study this relationship, we can start to see it a little bit more. The difference between the freezing point and boiling point of water on Celsius and the Kelvin scale is 100. On Fahrenheit, it's 180. 180 divided by 100 is 1.8. Difference of the freezing point, 0 and 32, is going to factor in as well. Turns out the formula for both those right here, temperature in Fahrenheit to the temperature in Kelvin has the 32 to exchange where they were both at the freezing point of water and the 1.8 to amplify it. So here's something interesting. 98.6 is standard body temperature. What is it in Celsius? We need to solve for that temperature. So let's see, 98.6 divided by 32. And then multiply, or and then, ooh, how about I do this math right? 98.6 minus 32. And then divide by the 1.8. I get a temperature in Celsius. It says 37, but since that had a decimal, 37.0 is probably the best significant figure rules to follow. 37.0 Celsius. And then there's the formula for uh, converting it to Kelvin. All right. And that finishes this, this, this chapter up. I know we have some practice for dimensional analysis that we can do. Um, we'll leave that uh, to a separate video.